Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Craig Grishel, welcome back, man. Hey, Gary. I'm always uh, always excited to talk to you both on podcast and uh, just in general friendship. It is. It's been it's been a crazy year, and I got to tell you, you've been one of those um, lifelines for me. <laughs> just uh, someone who will pick up the phone and and chat and just talk about life and how it's going on the inside, but also all the strategy issues we're faced with. So it's a joy to have you back on. So much has changed since the last time you were on the podcast and you've had the year of your life, I would assume, or close to it. It's got to be up there in the, in the top five. Um, I would like to start here. When Life Church got shut down for the first time ever in your ministry for in-person gatherings, um, what was that like for you? Like, can you just relay sort of the mental sequence of what March 2020 did to you as a leader who's used to preaching over three dozen locations, you know, to tens of thousands of people every weekend, and all of a sudden, boom, it's over. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for any um, pastor and for most leaders in different, fe- you know, whatever field they're in, it was uh, indescribably disorienting. And I was one, uh, you know, I had friends that were saying, you know, hey, this is going to be a real deal. It's going to last probably till summertime. That seemed way long to me. I was more on the shorter end of projections. It seems silly now to even that I was that foolish to think that way. But we were shutting down in March with the hopes of being open again in Easter, you know, which which is just I, I'm embarrassed that I didn't have more foresight than that. But that was it was. Um, I mean, it was really, really scary. It was something that none of us in any you know field is, uh, had ever faced before. So emotionally, it was disorienting trying to lead through it. You know, there was no, there's no rule book. I, I was joking around with our church because just like where you lead and where everyone listening is, there's so many extreme opinions. Hmm. I was joking and said, next time we go through a global pandemic racial unrest, social tension, and uh, election like we did in the U.S., I'll know how to lead through it. I've got experience, but none of us did then. And so it was, uh, yeah, it was really, really, really difficult. What did you learn about yourself and about crisis leadership um, over this last year? So I've been leading Life Church for 25 years and had five years of church leadership before that. So I've seen a fair bit, it, you know, it wasn't, it's not like I'm 28 years old. So I've been through some different things and I'm pretty confident in crisis leadership. So I've been through different types of, of crises before crises. And, um, it, you know, in, in difficult times, people want to be led. And so it's not it's not as hard as you think. It, there's some there's some basics. You know, you have to communicate, communicate, communicate over and over again. You have to bring the why behind everything that you're doing. You don't have to get it necessarily right. You just have to you, you know you kind of lead with a little bit of uncertainty and bring explanation behind it. And people want to be led, and so it's not that difficult. Uh, when this hit, though, it hit me in a different way than it had before, and it just seemed to be more complicated. Than, um, than, than I was anticipating. So what I learned about myself, in the early stages, Carrie, I think I learned that my identity was more wrapped up in some things that I probably didn't think it was wrapped up in. Uh, and I had to kind of um, untangle that. I learned that, uh, interestingly enough, I learned our church is way stronger than I thought we were. It's kind of what I told our staff that that I didn't think we could survive what we survived, mm-hmm. and not only not only survive, but in some ways made uh, uh, more of an impact than we would have otherwise. Not in every way, 
I'm not like one of those people that say, now it's incredible at all. I'm realistic. But we, we uh, our church was stronger than I thought. Our staff, my gosh, I found out just, you know, I thought they were amazing before. And my love and admiration for them went way up. And, um, you know, I guess kind of what was in me, there was a little more in some places than I realized I had in me. And there were other places I thought I was stronger and I wasn't quite as strong in some of those places. So it brought some reality to who I am as a leader, what I value. I think, I think that I'm, I'm wandering around. I think the biggest answer I have is it revealed values. Oh, wow. It really revealed values. And, um, I think that's true as, as kind of we look around what is important and even not, we could, we could disagree politically or, you know, but, but we could agree on values. And so it, it, um, was one of, it is the, it was the greatest, um, See, it was the most, uh, the biggest season of revealing values in my life and leadership, I'd say. What did you learn about your values? You know, oddly enough, I know I'm really biased toward the church anyway, because that's what we do. Yeah. But I just, just realized that I don't just love the church. I need the church. I crave the church. And by that, I mean the people, the gathering, the presence of God with people. And, um, uh, it, I like love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. So I have to be careful not to be one of those that says, let's open up the doors at any cost because my bias is to gather. And so I had to really take a step back and look at this holistically and say, what's, what is, and it's really complicated, Carrie, because, yeah. you know, in, uh, um, in rough times in the past, a lot of times the church runs in and puts themselves at risk in order to reach people. Mm -hmm. And so when we close the doors to the church, we're protecting people's physical health in a pandemic, but we're raising the risk in some cases for mental health issues or spiritual health issues by not being able to address them in some of the same ways. So there's a give and take to all of it. None of it's clean to me. And I get frustrated with the leaders that say, you know, it's really clean. Like it's, you should do, you should be open no matter what you should be closed no matter what, like, you know, grow a brain and look at it from a little bigger perspective. It's just not that cut and dry. There's a lot of nuances to it. And if you can't see those nuances, then I don't know the, how you can lead, lead well. What you said, you found yourself strong. I think this is probably a human nature statement. I think a lot of us were surprised, but you said you were stronger in some areas. You had more in the tank than you thought. And then you found yourself maybe not as strong as you would want to be in certain areas. Can you share to the extent that you're comfortable, like where you surprised yourself with your resilience and then where you're like, Ooh, that's a vulnerability. I didn't notice. Yeah. So this is, I know you've got a broad audience and not everybody would be necessarily Christians, but for me, it was kind of crazy is I, I was leading through the most complicated season of my leadership and didn't feel like I could hear from God. Oh, wow. and, and that didn't rattle me. I didn't like it. I couldn't explain it. Uh, I had to lead by what I'd kind of considered instinct and gut and intuition and experience. And I couldn't, I just didn't feel like I was hearing the voice of God for months like in the uh, sense of open, close, do this, do that, or more like you, there was just a barrier there. Yes. And, and anything, just like, you know, give me something, give me a word, give me a direction, give me a sign. And it, the odd thing is that it, it didn't rattle my faith. It strengthened it because I did, I, I wanted a word, a direction, um, confirmation. And when I didn't get it, I realized that I had enough of God's direction and goodness and conviction and correction in the past that I didn't doubt that he was with me. Wow. And, and I don't, I'm not one of the leaders that say, I, I don't have to go up to the mountaintop to hear from God, to make a decision. Sometimes you just make a decision. Yeah. And I, I don't, that's unspiritual. Some people would, I think that's just the way life is. And that sometimes you just have to make a decision. And so I was just making decisions based on instinct, intuition, experience. And I didn't like it, but I realized that my faith was strong enough to continue even though I wasn't feeling something in the middle of it all. And that was, that was um, reassuring to me. And then I can't remember when it was, but uh, I did. I really, really, really felt like 
uh, I heard from God in a way that was significant. And it just, the, then at that point, the emotions, I'm not a real emotional leader. Mm. My emotions, I couldn't contain them. I couldn't contain them. Wow. It was like, like you like, you think your kid is missing and your kid comes home. It was that emotional to me. Mm. There, there it is. There's, there's the word from God. And, um, so that was, you know, it was really in the middle of it. It was not something I'd ever want to uh, redo. But looking back, I like the result of what it did in me. Anything that surprised you from the, oh, this this was more draining than I thought, or I, I thought I would have this and it really kind of, you know, side punched me, sucker punched me? Yeah, you know, I would say um, several things. Uh, I didn't. I didn't, I wouldn't have told you that my identity was wrapped up in the number of people in the room because our rooms are smaller. And so our, our total attendance can be kind of big, but our, um, I don't preach to a lot of people. And then when I was preaching to nobody, I just realized, or nobody in the room that was, uh, that was super emotionally and spiritually dis- disorienting to me. And I was, I was, how real is it without the people there? So I had to adjust my, um, kind of my emotional barometer to that, um, that was, uh, you know, that was one issue. And then, um, taking, I, I didn't realize how, uh, politically diverse our team was. I love, I, I love that we are really diverse in, um, in a, in a lot of different ways. I just didn't realize before because we'd been so mission focused. And then when some of the, uh, more complicated issues, uh, emerged, I realized we're a really diverse team. And so how do we, embrace that diversity, celebrate it, uh, and, and yet stay mission focused when a lot of people want to go, uh, be more divisive in their actions that, that took a toll, um, you know, on me emotionally. Uh, but on the other side, I'm, again, I'm real thankful where we are. Yeah. How do you, that? I'm really glad you raised that Craig. And, and I'd love to know how, how do you navigate that? Um, because I think almost every leader realized, oh, not everybody thinks like me and, you know, we're not a political organization, but all of a sudden I've got this division on the board or this variety of opinion on the board or the executive team or the staff or in the congregation. What were some things that guided you through that? Well, I, you know, I didn't, I I never thought everybody thinks just like me, but I did think that, uh, I didn't realize that we had some, what I kind of, I consider like really um, polarizing views mm. on, on the team where there are, there are some extremes that they're incredibly frustrating to me because I would say they're, they're, they're ex- I, I'd call it extremes without empathy. I have some real, I have some really extreme views and don't ever, I'm never going to pretend like I don't. Uh, and, but at the same time, I really work incredibly hard to have empathy and to, to have a genuine understanding of, of how someone born in a different part of the world, raised in a different family, maybe with a different color skin or different background, different fears, different opportunities and different threats, how that person can love the same God I love or not and think in an entirely different way than I, I can think. And uh, I didn't realize how many, uh, a few of our team members and a lot of our church members uh, don't, uh, think beyond their little social media bubble mm-hmm. and that someone that thinks in a different way can't be a Christian or isn't right, or you know, there's no way they're a spiritual person or whatever. And that was incredibly frustrating to me. And so I spent, I felt like I spent a lot of time trying to help people see if you're that small minded, you're always going to have a limited impact. And mm-hmm. you, you know, as a leader, you're not going to be a great leader if you don't have some extreme views. You've got to have some extreme views and opinions. That's what that's the mark of any great leader. You're, we're we're going to be weird in ways. We've got we got strong biases and we've got incredible passion and we've got blind sides, all that kind of stuff. But if we if 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 we're only listening to respond and never listening to understand, then we can't have a real impact. Um, and I, I became frustrated at how different pockets of the church, our church and just the church, um, would let, uh, would let some issues become more important than the main mission and not be able to love someone that had a different viewpoint on an issue. It's, uh, it's, uh, so that's, that's my tone and leadership is shifting some to address a problem. I wasn't as aware existed before all of this. 
Hmm. Boy, we could spend the whole hour on that. I'm just before we leave it. When you think about a meeting where these opinions are surfacing, whether that's a board, a senior leadership team, a staff meeting, or even maybe you're meeting someone in your congregation and they've got divergent views, how do you refocus them on the mission? Like, how do you listen but not let it become the vaccine, no vaccine, um, open, close, uh, you know, mask, no mask? How do, how do you not get stuck in those ruts? Well, I, I think one thing you have to do is I think you have to acknowledge both sides. And I think you have to give some, you have to give some credibility to both sides. You could take all of those issues open, not open. We kind of talked about that. Yeah. There's a, there's a reason why being open really does matter. And there's a reason why being open is a little, is risky. Um, mask, no mask. There's a reason why, um, there's a lot of data that says they work. And there's a lot of people that say they don't work at the end of the day. If no matter what you believe, you, you know, you, you got to think about the other person in the room and you got to be, you got to be loving in your attitude. Vax, no vax. There's a lot of a lot of people think it's the it's the um, the the answer, and other people think you're going to get a chip in and you're going to die and what, whatever. And so you know what you you really you have to acknowledge and genuinely understand why people think in both ways, and so that you've got credibility with both people. If you're you you can have like I've got pretty strong views on all those things, um, but I. I've worked to have an understanding of, of the reason why someone would think in a different way and respect it, like genuinely respect it. And if I can do that, then I can lead gr- both groups of people. If I don't respect and can explain and understand how they can think in a different way, then I really don't have, I don't, I, I don't have credibility with them. doesn't mean I have to agree at all, but I have to understand it. And so I think you have to build a premise that you do understand. And then you focus, you just, you're going to be, we're going to be above, above that. That's not going to be our driving force. We're going to treat people lovingly and, um, and then just point everything back to the mission. But I, I don't think you can go straight to the mission without, without diving in a little bit to the issues and, um, showing empathy, showing understanding. And, and then when you do something, let's say you do open the doors um, or you don't, or you ask people to wear a mask, or you don't enforce it. Whatever it is, you have to be really, really clear on the why. Here's the why we're doing this. And even if you're someone disagrees with your why, if you if you give them a why, at least you're giving them something. And I think it's uh, and and acknowledging that here's some people would disagree, and we respect that. But here's why we're doing it. So you you just have to genuinely care about someone with a different viewpoint. Uh, and not and not write them off from it. The bottom line is, you know, I've been wrong on some things. I was wrong on how long it would last. I was wrong on, you know, uh, you know. I think it was I. It was more serious, less serious than I thought. We're not all right, and so you, you have to lead with grace, understanding, and um, and, exp- and explanation. I'm so glad you shared that, Craig, because you're not going to find that on your social media feed. You see people dismissing each other, arguing with each other, and I think you've gotten very quickly to the essence of. Um, what real, real leadership is in, in the midst of a crisis. And I think that, uh, what do you call it? Uh, empathy? There, there was, uh, you, you said something. It was like, uh, you know, extreme views with empathy or something like that. I don't know. It's better. We'll go back to the show notes and have a look at it. But I, I want to I frame that one. Um, you did mention, and, and, and that kind of surprised me. Uh, I've been listening to you communicate for two decades. I think you're a masterful communicator. You do a great job. And, you know, on your own leadership podcast, You've talked into a camera with no crowd now for years, right? Like you've done that. You launched your leadership podcast with that. But all of a sudden, you find yourself in an empty room outside of the production crew. And you said that was jarring and really made you realize, wow, I love speaking to crowds. What was so different about that? What did you learn um, about speaking to an empty room? So to, to really be clear on how it hit me, because I think it hit everybody differently. It wasn't just, I can speak to an empty room. I've done that for a long time. Yeah. But it uh, it kind of made me, it, it it forced me to redefine what is success. Is it a crowd in the room? Is it the feedback that you get? Is it the numbers that you can see that come in and say, "Here's how many people we had," and if they're, if they're in, if the numbers shift to a different category, do they count in the same way? The, you know, we could talk digital numbers for a long time if you wanted. We have a, a debate. Uh, I, I have again extreme views of what success is online versus what it's not in my views different than the norm, I think. Um, but I had to, I had to recenter on that. As far as the preaching to the empty room, 
you know, uh, I always, I was always aware that there was a, a significant audience digitally because we've been doing that for a long time. But when it was the only one, it does change the way you think. And so a little bit what we were doing is trying to help other churches. We had tens of thousands of churches start using our um, free online platform. And then they had never done it before. So we spent, honestly, a lot of time working with doing videos for pastors, teaching them just how do you look at a camera? Like, what, like you know, you do it well, but if the little light comes on when you're looking at it, that helps. Where do you position the camera in the room? If it's way across the back, it's harder than if you put it on the third row. How do you, uh, you know, how do you visualize someone on the other side? All those kind of things. And so, uh, you know, it was just working through those both in the identity with us. How does this impact, you know, what is success? What is God honoring? And then helping other churches do it. Um, it, was a, it was a learning thing for a lot, a lot of pastors, I think. Hmm. Um, you, uh, you, and I don't want to tell tales out of school, but, uh, I think, you know, when you and I've had conversations about numbers before, whether those are podcast numbers, online numbers, is it fair to say you're not a multiplier guy? You tend to be a discounter when people bring you numbers, you'll take the most conservative viewpoint on those numbers or what is your approach to counting online? I, I am, I, you know, like, I don't care what somebody else reports and says, but they're like, you know, like the, the moment it's funny because a lot of pastors discovered online for the first time. Yeah. It's funny how their theology changed. <laughs> there were a lot of, <laughs> All of a sudden it's like, Whoa, that's not real church. And then, then, uh, there, and a lot of pastors don't know. So they got some team member that can tells them how many Facebook views they had. And suddenly, you know, they may have had 300 people at their church on Sunday. And now they've got 1200 clicks somewhere digitally. And they think, wow, we've exploded. We're reaching so many more people. And I don't want to burst their bubble or whatever, but I, you know, you need to do your homework that, and then they, then they say, and there's 2.5 people or 3.4 people watching for every view. And I'm going, you know what? A lot of those, they were on there for three seconds and they were done. Or we went to church online with my family back in March, April when we, when we could, and I'd have all my kids and grandkids there. And I was like going, Hey, nobody watching this right now. They're all in the room. It's on, but nobody's paying attention. So the quality of, um, of engagement is in question. The number of people, you know, how long they're on is, is in question where they're coming from, all that kind of stuff, what they actually do with it. Can they process it? Can they pay attention? So, I, I didn't celebrate the, like, now we're impacting three times, four times as many people. I'm incredibly concerned that we have to work way, 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 way harder to retain them, to connect them relationally, to give them an experience that engages them with other people. I believe, Carrie, that church is not just absorbing content. Mm -hmm. that's, that's TV ministry, that's podcast, that's YouTube, and those are all really important. And I hope that everybody does whichever one of those fits their their um, gifts and experiences and passions, but watching a, watching an Andy Stanley sermon or a Chris Hodges sermon or a Mike Todd sermon or whatever while I'm on the treadmill, uh, I really believe God intends more for us in in His church. That is, the, it's a gathering and it's a serving, it's a sending, it's a corporate um, expression, which I do believe wholeheartedly can happen online, just in the same way we're having a form of community right now, but. It's uh, we have to remember what church is and what um, enjoying content is. Those are two different things. Uh, there's some there's some overlap, but they are they are different. And we have to be really really clear on what the goal is. Yeah, you can um, you could be you could just preach from a uh, room and do nothing but YouTube right now. That could be a really really effective ministry. There's some churches that maybe they should just do that, and that 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 would be, that'd be a win for them. I'm not going to discount that at all. It's a great thing. We should celebrate it, applaud it, and, and a lot of people should do it. But if we're pastors and if we value the, the church gathering, then we'll, we, we may still stream our content, but our strategy of how we engage people needs to be different, needs to be intentional. We just need to be clear about it. And so that's why I make a distinction between what's a real win for us versus just a click and a number someone gives me on a page. Mm. I think that's really good. I know you and I talked over the summer a couple of different times as we were all trying to figure that out. And I really appreciated it because I asked you one day about multiplier and you're like, no, 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 no multiplier. Like, I think you're right. I think there's this idea we all have as pastors or communicators about what's happening in the average home 
when a family's watching and everybody's attentive and focused and taking notes. And then there's the reality of what's happening and the kids are climbing all over the place and you're cooking breakfast and it's like, wow, okay, that's what's really happening. Scrolling on social media and you're, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's, it's a. <laughs> I hear you, Craig. Uh, so you guys pretty much, I think you could say that uh, Life Church either invented church online or was one of the absolute first movers in that space through what Bobby Grunwald brought to your team. And we've talked to him about that on the podcast before. We'll link to that in the show notes. Um, but all of a sudden, it, the system got tested in a way it has never been tested. And you got an opportunity to see last year what online church could deliver and what it couldn't deliver in probably a, a setting you'd never experienced in the 15 years prior to that. What did it deliver on that you hoped it would deliver on? And then were there some things it just couldn't deliver on in your view? Um, so in, initially, and I'm assuming most churches saw something similar to this, we saw a really big spike. Yeah. So, you know, the and then, you know, March was big, uh, Easter was biggest, and then we saw a pretty dramatic slide all the way till about the end of May, then it stabilized and climbed back up. So, what we do, what we do know, is that uh, the reach is real. Meaning, we can we can impact people all over the world, and that's really special. We we kind of, we knew that before because we've been doing it for a long time. A lot of churches discovered it, and then we kind of just discovered it in, in a new and more impact, uh, emboldened way. Like this is this is really really. Not shouldn't be just an afterthought for any of us. It should be at the front of our minds all the time for the rest of our ministries. So, um, you know, there was that part of it. I, I forgot your question again. I was I, no. I, what I, did it deliver on? And you, you've kind of started to answer that. And then where where did it not deliver? Where where you're like, oh, these are the weaknesses of the system. We and we did some things, carry that were you know we added a Wednesday night online experience. But, you know, that's not innovative. Nothing fancy about that. But it created a midweek connection that was super important to our people. So that, so we started asking not just how do we connect them for, you know, a few hours here and there, but how do we, how do we um, communicate with them daily? How do we, how do we help them have connection with God uh, and, and then connection with each other daily? So I went from thinking kind of what I'd call Sunday to Sunday to daily. That was, that was different. And uh, so it delivered, that I think over time, what happened in the early days, there was a little bit of um, intrigue and mystique with it. And people were like, wow, this is really cool. We can go to church this way. And then people like, oh, so I think some people said, we'll do this forever. This is amazing. Then, then I think there, you, you might call it Zoom fatigue, mm -hmm. that people meetings on, on nonstop. And, and it was kind of my fear. I think they just got tired of screens in some ways. And so suddenly you realize there's, there, there are limitations. Um, you can't hug online. You can't lay hands online. You can't um, go and deliver food online. You can't baptize online. And so, you know, you can, you can run through the list and every benefit is a real one and should be celebrated. And every limitation is a real one and should be acknowledged. We have to we have to acknowledge what's there, call it what it is, not pretend like one form of church is better than the other. They're just different. If we gather, it's a little different. If we meet gather digitally, it's a little bit different. And just tell the truth is the bottom line is we have to be we have to really be honest about what works, where it works, why it works, why it doesn't work. If it's not working, what do we need to do? Supplement it? Can we supplement it? Do we have any other options? And if we're really trying to make disciples, we want to use everything that's there, but we can't pretend that it's all equal. It's not. There's there's benefits and costs to all the different forms of expression. I remember as you were reopening for um, in-person services, you told me that you're going 100% in on online and 100% in on in-person. Can you unpack that thinking a little bit and how do you still feel that way now all these months later? Or what are you learning about that 100% online, 100% in-person? Yeah, I do. So, you, you know, to, again, we've been doing online church, church online, like little, not streaming, but church online with real live interaction, pastors, teams, you know, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers all over the world, really big numbers for, um, since 2006. We've got a lot of experience. We have a team. I, I want to, I don't want to just, I mean, it may sound weird to say numbers, pretty substantial staff team that, that runs it. But for me, it was always something I valued, but it wasn't at the front of my mind. And so 
this, that what this did is it brought it to the front of my mind. It, it had to for everybody. And it hasn't dropped is kind of the way I'd say it now that we're meeting. We're able to meet physically most places again. So what happened is it was it was a real important part of our strategy to some people. Now we want it to be a real important part of our strategy to all of our people, all of our team. And that's the, that's I think the best way to say it. And that's is, kind of moving on a moving forward basis. It's like, hey, from what we've learned, we're just yeah, it's important to everybody now. Uh, yes, it's it's in you know, there are some people you know like a they're not going to think about it as much, but mm. certainly. Everybody should think about it more, and most of us should think about it often. It's, it, it is a higher priority, in, um, and it should be for everyone doing any form of ministry and leadership, in my opinion, moving forward. And then 100% in on physical. What are, what are your thoughts behind that? Well, so I, I don't know, man. I'm, again, I've been wrong a lot, so I'm willing to be wrong. But, you know, what's going to happen in the future? I just, I wholeheartedly believe that there's going to be a solution, meaning uh, no matter what you believe about the vaccine, it works, or we get um, herd immunity, or there's a higher tolerance, or it morphs and it's not as the, the virus isn't uh, hurting as many people or whatever. I just, if you look back historically, Carrie, I think we'd be just crazy not to think that people are going to go to concerts again, movies again, sporting events again, and church again. So. I am leading with 100%. I'm 100% convinced. Again, I could be wrong, but in my mind, I'm not uh, wavering in my faith that people are going to gather again. So we, we opened up a couple of campuses in the middle of the pandemic. I'm, and I'm betting that however long, name it, 18 months, two years, five years, whatever it is, that that's going to be a necessary part of the landscape of Christianity. I'm betting on the gathering long term, as well as I'm betting on digital long term. And I also believe personally that there'll be some people that probably never go back to a physical location because they've learned a different um, expression of worship digitally, and so they won't. But I also believe there's people that wouldn't have gone to a physical building before that will go now because they're hurting in a, in a way that's different than they were hurting before. So however, whatever the percentage of people that is, we want to be positioned to minister to them. And so we're not, we're not shrinking back on either strategy. Um, we're just as aggressive in, in it, like in our world, our language be planting physical churches or campuses. And we're still planning on doing it. And we're, um, if we've redeployed some resources more toward not just online church, but social media, YouTube, the tail podcast, the whole, you know, c content distribution, as well as supporting other churches. We're putting a ton of money um, into Uversion to create a tool that churches can use all the time, not just, you know, uh, to read the Bible, but is, you know, I, I can't say too much yet. Same with church online. We've really, you know, put, you know, lots and lots into that to make it a better experience for churches. And um, <clears throat> so we're doing what we can both to impact people through our ministry. And then we just feel really passionate that if we can help make it available to other churches and make it better for them, that's part of our calling. And so we want to do that too. And on behalf of all the leaders, let me just say thank you for that massive investment. Everybody benefits from it. And if you haven't, like the free Bible app, version, you just search Bible app. Um, last time I talked to Bobby, it's like almost is it 400 million installs or something globally? It's, it's crazy. It's an insane number. Yeah. And yeah. And I'll say too, to you, I just want to, I haven't had a chance yet. Everybody does their part, right? You know, that's something we can. Do. And, um, but you, you know, you offer tremendous value and I, I just have to compliment your leadership, your, your content, you know, long before you were known broadly, you were creating valuable content and it's, it's a result of your, your content, your integrity, your relationships, your just behind the scenes hard work that now you've got a broad audience. And that's a gift. And so, you know, we don't brag like, hey, we just created the Uversion Bible Lab. Look how great we are. That's just our thing. And that wasn't that wasn't my thing back in when I was 28 or 30 years old. You know, we weren't able to do that. But we were able to share our little church van someone donated with another church. And that's what we could do back then. You know, and so Every church can do whatever their thing is or every Christian or, you know, ministry and you just do it. And, and so anyway, I wanted to say to you, thank you. You've 
you added a ton of value to my personal leadership and our our um, our whole team loves what you what you produce. It's it's uh, super helpful. Well, thank you so much, Craig. And and you're a big part of it. I mean, the conversations uh, are very very helpful to me. <laughs> One of the things that that interests me is you're you're a habit guy. And I remember you said to me in the middle of the pandemic, as churches were reopening, you said, "Hey, habits are being formed right now. Like yep. people who've been away, it was a matter of weeks or months at the time, but you're like they're getting into a habit." I would love for you to pick this up. So this airs in February of 2021. Just on whether you think there have been any new habits that have been formed for people for good or bad, you know, no editorial comment, but like, yeah, church attendance will be more frequent, less frequent. Uh, Digital be a bigger part of people's lives. Or what are some of the habits that you think could have been formed over the last 12 months that uh, may be a bit permanent? Super, super big question. I don't even know where to start. Yeah. So um, let me try to think. Where, where I want to start. Um, for, for if people had good disciplines, uh, healthy habits going into the pandemic, most of them fared better than those who didn't. So if you were, you know, if you were, if you were regularly exercised and the gym closed, you're doing pushups on your floor, you know, or sit ups because that was a part of your life. And those people fared be- better. Uh, if you had good eating habits, chances are your, your odds of, Continue to eat good were really good if you had marginal ones or, you know, um, say not just physical, but mental, emotional, spiritual, prayer, discipline, all those, any kind of habits. If they were strong and structured, you'd sh- probably fare a lot better. If they were weak or vulnerable in any way, the odds of you spinning out really w- are high. And so, you know, we just, we saw people that had been sober for eight years go back into using hardcore drugs. You get this. If they didn't, if they weren't solid and stable, in relationships, you know, struggling. So, the um, to answer your question, Carrie, I'd say the response is very wildly. There are some people who'd say this has been the best thing that ever happened to my marriage, and other people said I lost my marriage because of it. So, there's it's so circumstantial. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're if you're targeting it toward church, what I would say is this: Oh my gosh, all my pastor friends, like when we open the door, they're all coming back. Like pull your head out; they're not coming back. They are not, 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 not all of them because we have trained them. This, I'll give you an, ex, an idea. I have wor- I worked out for 28 years with, with my buddy called, named John. Yeah. 28 years we worked out. During the pandemic, we couldn't work out. We've only worked out once since, only one time. Why? Because I work out at my home gym now. That's what I do because wow. I formed a new habit. 28-year habit. And we've only worked out one time because our rhythms have changed. And so now people, when it comes to church, if, if they were a Sunday morning person is now they do what they sleep in, or now they go work in their yard, or now they stream a podcast and do whatever, you know, they so their habits are, are different. And we just have to acknowledge that the key is, as leaders, we don't get mad about it. We don't get resentful. We just have to tell the truth about it. And my fear is that a lot of my peers just aren't telling the truth. We're living in this optimistic bubble about, you know, one of both sides. Either they're all going to come back, it's going to be great, or nobody's coming back and we're going to be dead. The truth is it's in between. And no matter what we have, we have to lead, period. We have to lead. And we've all lost something. So if you talk physical attendance right now, ours is about 50% where it was the previous year. And so it's really easy to say we've lost significant impact. And there's a part of me that drifts toward that. But what I've done is I've trained my mind to say, no, look what we have. We still have this group of people that's really passionate about being gathered together. We can do something with them. Um, We still have a group online that's gathering every week. And we've got the ability to evangelize online like never before. So we have that. And so we have to fight as leaders not to be overly optimistic or overly discouraged, but just tell the truth. And we can't mourn about what we've lost, but rejoice in what we do have and be grateful for what we do have. Because if you still got your health, that's a lot. If you still have your faith, that's a lot. If you still have a good relationship with your kids, that's a lot. If you used to have 400 people at your church, now you got 200 people, you can do something with 200 people. If you built it once, you can build it again. And you'd have to fight for that mindset or you just can't lead. If we're 
if we're defeated, if we're hurting, if we're afraid, if we're negative, if we're pessimistic, if we're down, if we're doubting, if we think it's over, or if we're too optimistic and in, in our in our um, looking at it realistically, then we can't. Whatever we have, we have to tell the truth about it. Then we have to stand up and just lead toward the desired result. And I guarantee we've got something to do. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you're in coasting now. You got something to do. You got, you got growth problems, or they're not coming problems that. That uh, that should engage you, and it shouldn't it work to let it not discourage you, but but let it pull the best out of you. You 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 have what it takes, Christians. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. You still got the Word of God. You can still preach. You can preach like no, you got online giving. Thank God we live in today. If this had happened years ago, there'd be no online giving. You got digital reach. If that happened years ago, we wouldn't have that. We live in a good day to face. This is a good time in history for us to face these problems. And yes, there's more tension, more division, more hurt, more anger, more fear. And what better time to get the gospel out than in that climate? So we got our work cut out for us. Let's just try to wake up and fight for that that mindset. Well, I want to talk uh, for most of the rest of this episode about mindset because you've written an incredible book on it. And I don't say that lightly. Um, But before we shift gears, any model shift that comes out of this, you... Uh, and we talked about this on, on on the podcast. We'll link to all the other episodes in the show notes where you and I have shared in that. But, you know, you pretty much had a great system that you've worked really hard on for campuses and you kind of know the square footage and the cities you need to go into and, you know, the seat turns and stuff like that. Any thoughts about micro gatherings or any model adjustments and how you're doing the church moving forward? You don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I didn't want to leave it out. So I think I've got a lot of, peers that are pretty passionate about micro gatherings. And so it might be that you, you know, you have a church of whatever and you broadcast and there's, you know, four families or 18 people or 12 people or whatever gather in homes. And that, so kind of micro churches. And I would say, you know, as pastors, we should just be for any form of gathering that creates spiritual value and points people to Jesus. So I'm for it. I'm also for bigger gatherings. I do think that uh, I, I don't expect people to break ground on any 7,000 seat auditoriums or sanctuaries right now, like, like they did a few years back. So I think that'll change. Uh, I just, I don't think that micro gatherings are better and I don't think that big gatherings are better. I think they're different. There's, you can go intimate and deep if you're in a micro gathering, but you can't raise a million dollars this weekend likely to do something and you can't go and serve a whole neighborhood after a tornado hits. So you've got some, you've got some benefits and you've got some limitations in a bigger church. People can be anonymous and you might not have the as deep of ministry, but you can do a lot together. And so my encouragement to pastors is don't lock in on the model, kind of keep your hands open and say, let's just, let's just see, let's see what God blesses with us. And then be what you are without being what you, against what you're not. And that's so, so important. Like just be, be, be for what you are. Like we love this and you know, so we're a multi-site church. We can do it. We can go in and we, so I'm, I'm for what we are, but I'm not going to be against what we're not. And that's where it's really ridiculous. We're like all oh, mega churches or whatever, you know, pull your, don't be stupid. There's some good things going on. Well, micro churches are the way of the future or mega, you know, multi-size the way of the future. Like now this is just, it's a different way. Benefits and drawbacks of all of them. And so just as far as model changes, I think it creates some new opportunities. I don't think a lot of the old ideas are going to go away. Yeah. I think people still gather and um, we'll see. It's good. You know, just to timestamp this, we're recording this uh, before Christmas 2020. It'll uh, um, come out on the podcast in February, right around the time of your book launch. But I just want to say this has been one of the most refreshing interviews I've done in a while. And just I can see the work that you've done on mindset. Like you are you've led through the most difficult year of your life and you've got a positive open mindset about division, tribalization, about the model, about digital, about in-person. And I just want to say it's refreshing, but mindset is something that you've worked really, really hard on over the years. And you open the book, Craig, with something, and we've known each other for a while, that kind of shocked me, but there's lies that kind of haunt all of us as leaders. And you've had a lie that has followed you around since you were a kid 
Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So the, the book is called Winning the War in Your Mind. Uh, subtitle is Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. And I think if you asked me, you know, what am I most personally proud of? Mm-hmm. And you could ask Amy too, or what, what, no, what is she, my wife, what, is, what change has she noticed in the last five years? I'd say hands down 100% that um, adjusting, retraining, and allowing God to re- renew my mind is the number one hands down thing I'm most proud of and thankful for. Because you can be, you can be successful on the outside and be losing the battle on the inside in your mind. And uh, sometimes what even makes you outwardly successful can be your inward dysfunctions. And so uh, I would say that I'm, I've got a lot of real weaknesses, vulnerability, dysfunctions, and some of those work for me in outward production. Uh, you, you know, one of the, I think the, what you're talking about in the book I talked about is, you know, there's kind of two big ones and uh, there's actually more, but the two I wrote about most would be one of them is just like, is, is the lie that uh, yeah, I'm, I'm never enough. I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to produce enough. And I just, I grew up thinking that first was being first place was the only form of success. Anything else was a failure. And that sounds, you know, that's kind of fun to be like, yeah, when, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's actually a really distorted view that only sets you up for success and it makes you a workaholic and a bad, it could make you a bad spouse, bad parent, bad friend. It's just not a good mindset. And so I've had to really work to find my identity and things outside of success. And the more success you have, the harder it is to do that. Yeah. Or the more you the more you see success on social media or whatever, it makes you think that's what you want, that's what you need, and it's not. You can't have enough of it to ever um, quench your insatiable desire. So you have to. I've had to renew my mind to have my identity be in different places. So that's why when I mentioned the fact that the crowd was gone and it shocked me, that it hit me in a way that it did. It's because I've done so much work and I thought I was kind of beyond that, and I was like, yeah, I still have more work, work to do. And so you know, I've really, 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 really fought, and it's been a years of a battle of taking the negative, toxic, unhealthy, the, the, the inner dialogue, and replacing it with God-honoring, positive, faith-filled truth. And it's like, I'm ridiculously passionate about it. I, I want to talk about Jesus first and always, but right there, I want to talk about how he changes your, if you can, if you can let him change your thinking, it will change your life. It's, it's really I'm in a special season, ridiculously special season, because my mindset is different. Hmm. That uh, I'm not good enough. And uh, it was a pretty moving passage in the book, kind of choked me up. And you're right. A lot of that stuff can drive your behavior. And my total amateur psychology, Craig, is I've seen people implode with that. They start really bad addictions or... Uh, and I've also seen people, I call it explode. In other words, well, I'm just going to work out extra hard or we're going to grow this thing or I'm going to be successful or whatever. How do you think that lie drove you when you look back on your life? Well, I think I was, I was just trying to prove my worth with production, period. You know, and then so other people will try to prove their worth by, you know, being likable or by not being criticized or by being the perfect mom or having the best appearance or having money in the bank or whatever. And so, you know, that's how it manifested me. And the way it worked for me is if you're trying to prove your worth by production, you might produce a lot, you know, and, uh, but you also, if it's done out of an unhealthy place, it's kind of like a house of cards. Eventually it's going to tumble. And so you want to make sure that the foundation of whatever you're building is healthy and, and that's, you know, it starts in your mind, Shep. I mean, your, 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 your life and leadership is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And whatever, you, whatever organization you lead, it's a reflection of the thoughts that you think, period, period. I mean, if I, if I'm, if I feel like you can't trust people or they're all, always out for themselves, I'm going to have a, um, an organization where people don't trust each other. If I believe the best about others and believe they can do things better than I can, we're going to have an empowering organization. If I believe things are bad and they're going to get worse, we're going to have a tentative and afraid organization. If I believe there are possibilities, even in the middle of hard times, we're going to have an aggressive, innovative organization. So your whatever you lead is a reflection of the thoughts you think. And you can, uh, wherever, wherever there's that secret inner dialogue, you can, people may not ever hear you say it or think it, but they're going to feel it. 
<laughs> how did your team feel it? Like, how did Life Church feel it when those negative thoughts? And I realize we're all a work in progress, and we want to get to the progress. But how do you think? Because I look back, I've had a similar journey. Like, there were some things that I hadn't wrestled down as a young leader, and I think the people around me pay a price. Paid a price. My wife paid a price. The church paid a price. My team paid a price. What? What? How did you see that sort of leak out around you? Yeah. So I, so I totally did. So you know, this is one of the. Uh, words that are, they're overused and it's, uh, it's misunderstood. And people say we're healthy right now. We're are, are, are really healthy, uh, healthy right now. What that typically means is there's no lawsuit, there's no moral scandal, and there's a little bit of money in the bank. That's what it means. And that's just, that's that's not healthy. That's that's just tomorrow hadn't hit yet. So uh, what what I'll say right now is like our our organization is ridiculously healthy. And it's not because I say it, it's because we test it. We do tons of anonymous interviews where we find out what what they think, how they feel, and they rate it. And it's it's and then we compare them with national averages. And it's it's is almost and it's not because of me, but it's almost unparalleled in the results. Well, you you were the number one workplace in Glassdoor in 2019, was it? I think it was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um. And you know, see, we were, by the time this comes out, we'll be a contender again, possibly. Um, but it's uh, it wasn't always that way, yeah. and it's more that way because of other people than because of me. And I want to be real clear about that because I I really have people much better than I am that are creating the culture. And when I was more hands on, it was more dysfunctional, like really dysfunctional because. My standards, my drive, my work ethic, uh, it can at times be unreasonable. My expectations of people, uh, my the way I'll demand out of them without always having an understanding. On my own, uh, I created more of a toxic, workaholic, fear-based culture that got results, but it wasn't always out of a healthy place. Once I started empowering better people and started changing my own mindset and recognizing that you, you got to give stuff away, you got to empower, you got to have a, you got to have a massive, not just tolerance, but love and appreciation for different styles of work and leadership. For example, I was in the office four o'clock yesterday in the morning. I was in at 6 a.m. today and I got mad at people that roll in at nine or 10, you know, that. But, but what I forget is I go home, I'll be done at two thirty or three and I'm done for the day. You know, so I go, yeah. So like I cut corners on the other side. And what I've had to learn is like, there are people, if you let them, if you let them, if you hire great people and they don't show up till 10 AM, it's probably because they worked till 10 PM last night. It's a different style. If you hire great people and don't overmanage them, like we don't have any vacation limitations. The only limitation is you have to take the minimum, but there is no maximum. Wow. I mean, time off, you get more time off. It, 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 because, it, and then suddenly people start saying, you're not controlling me, you're valuing me. You believe in me. If you, if you, and then you get this great culture, but I did not create that on my own because I thought if I can't see you working, you're probably not working. That's just not true. I had to change my mindset to where if we hire great people, let them work when they want to work, how they want to work and just believe they're getting it done. If not, we'll, it will sn- sniff it out and they won't be here for long. Our culture won't tolerate it, but we, we have to tolerate differences. And so my mindset has had to change of valuing different styles of leadership. At the end of the day, what I want to do is I want to value people who I want I want to celebrate people who have similar values, have great gifts and create something I can't create on my own. And that's what leads to a healthy culture. It's, it's never me, it's always we. Never me, always we. And the thing is, all of us were too distorted in our leadership to create it on our own. And that's why the more I did it, the more dysfunctional it was. The more we did it, I've got Jerry Hurley, who's got exceptional HR gifts, but he's not as detail-oriented. I've got Sam Roberts, who's got unbelievable systematic gifts, but is not as relational. I've got Bobby Grunewald, who's got unbelievable innovative I- ideas, uh, but he, he may not show up on time, you know, cause he's somewhere he's, he's he, you know, oh, he, he ta- he's still talking in the last meeting. You've got me who's, um, demanding, uh, has a, has a hard work ethic, but doesn't always, um, stop to slow down and listen to the person sitting across from me or whatever, mm-hmm. put it all together, focus on our strengths and coach each other to have understanding of weaknesses and appreciation for beyond ourselves. And we can create something pretty special. 
But you, it, go you ahead. got to have a massive tolerance for things different than your preferences. You have, you, to have a great organization, you have to you have to get over your preferences. There's so many things here that they're not the way I would do them. They're not even the way I like them, but they're effective and they're a healthy re- reflection of other people. And you have to have a, a high tolerance and appreciation for leadership styles beyond your comfort. How did you learn that? Slowly, like slowly and, and through a lot of pain and through honestly through like anonymous 360 reviews where people would critique me and burst my bubble about how great I thought I was. So the bottom line is I probably am more effective in leadership today only because of reps, meaning it's a been in the game for a while. And it, but I'm actually less confident today than ever before. I feel like I'm not as good as much as I'm around people that are really good. And that's kind of my secret is like, they make, they make me better. They make us better. We make us better. I make them better. They make me better. And so I, my, my views are pretty dang firm, but my confidence on my own is less. My confidence on us together is more. And so that's, what's different. And, um, and, you know, we've got a special thing here. I mean, you know, my, our top, um, four leaders, we've been, we've been together for over two decades. That's, that's, that's just ridiculously pretty special. special really special. And, and you just, you can't expect that in year four, year five, year six, year seven of an organization, you're still building it. And so it's really hard to have everything humming when you don't have everyone hired, right? It's hard to, <laughs> it, it's hard to have, um, you know, you're, when you're building it, you still don't, you, you may have the be butts and seats, but not the cash in the bank, or you may be an older church. You got the cash in the bank, but not the butts in the seat or your team is too young and they don't have the experience or they've all been around and now they're not young and no one's, you know, helping you stay for the younger generation. So it's, it's, um, it, it's always evolving. And the key is you don't want to ever be mad at the season you're in or resent it. You just want to call it what it is and make it the best for where you are and then lead toward a better future. And, um, and if you hang in there and if you do that for years and then decades, it can become pretty special. Not perfect, but pretty, pretty, pretty dang special. There's a whole section in the book on it, a couple of sections on retraining your mind, and I would encourage leaders to get it. It's a great book. But you say in the book that you wake up naturally by default, unretrained Craig, with some very negative thoughts in the morning, and you've learned to turn that around. And I know we're coming up on time, so I want to be respectful. But if you could just walk us through even that turnaround, uh, my negative ta- thoughts seem to start not first thing in the morning, but as soon as I encounter another human being, then they start. Um, so I would love for you to tell me how you have uh, retrained your mind in that well, the area. Fact, the fact that you acknowledge that's massive because so often, you know, we, we'll have a cognitive bias. Yeah. Uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have, you know, un, unhelpful neural pathways in our mindset. We thought the same thought so long, we don't know it's unhealthy. We think everybody thinks that way and they just don't. So you have to start with acknowledging it. And it took me years to realize that I didn't want to admit it, that I just had kind of a negative lens. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, it was more of like, I'm being realistic, you know, and if you even listen to my language in this podcast, it's embarrassingly telling because I've said, tell the truth and be realistic. And that, that comes out of, you know, don't lie about the numbers. And so I bent toward more of what can be a destructive skepticism or if managed well can be a healthy skepticism you, you need you need to have healthy but if unmanaged it becomes dangerous or destructive uh and so uh you know i had to recognize yeah i'm bent toward negative self-talk i'm bent toward a fear of things going wrong and all that kind of stuff and it plays out well when you anticipate and you have cash in the bank because if you're afraid there's gonna be a downturn and you anticipate it then you're then you're prepared for it so that works in your favor it also might mean you miss some opportunities because you're afraid to invest because you're afraid the future might fall apart. And so that's the, the downside. For me, Carrie, um, it's really amazing. I, I went from being characterized by being negative to, I, I'd say, not even characterized by positive, but I'd say more characterized by gratitude. I'm just so ridiculously grateful now. I can't even see straight. 
And I can go through the longest list of things I'm grateful for. And so if someone's listening, they're going to say, well, well, of course you're grateful. Your life's perfect. I, now, I can tell you right now that there's a lot of things that are indescribably painful and, and heartbreaking all around me. But I'm able to cope with them and lead through them because I'm, I'm, because I'm so grateful for what is right and what is God honoring. And so it just, in the funny, the, the sad thing is, is it, is it didn't, you know, it took, it's, it's taken years. If you've thought a certain way for years, you're not going to um, unthink that thought in three weeks time. Yeah. If you do write the book and I'll, I'll read it and endorse it, you know, please, because it's just, it's, you know, the way your brain's wired, you've got to retrain it or as scripture says, renew it. And, um, this, you know, just to tell you kind of the how is, mm-hmm. is, you know, I got real practical and nailed down the, here's where my thinking is wrong. And then I got real, real, real practical and said, here's what I want to think. Here's, here's the thought that I want to have. I tied it to scripture and then I, I br- just built some, some positive confessions tied into God's word that I've said over and over and over again. And it, uh, if I'm, if I told you in the first two years, it almost did no good at all. It, it felt like it was like, it was like it was useless, but I kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. It's a little bit like eating well and going to the gym. You can do it for six months and you see a little bit of improvement. You don't really see it kick into like three years in like going, yeah. wow, how'd this happen? Now I'm not just a person who eats pretty good and works out like I'm an athlete. It's, it's an identity change. And I'm not just a person who works on my mindset now. I'm a person who's got a mind being renewed by God's truth. It's a it's an identity change, uh, and it's it's taken a lot of work. And it's uh, I'd say it's the, the the most valuable thing I've done over the last you know several years. It's fun if you listen back on some of the episodes. I'm just going back. I remember you talk about reciting mantras and trying to retrain your mind. And it's fun to actually be able to say a few years later, wow, I think, I think that's had uh, a lot of fruit. And I love the way the book ends because your wife, Amy, who you've been married to for over 30 years, writes this beautiful little afterword or whatever it's called, where she's like, nobody knows Craig the way I do. And she just reflects because, you know, it's always our spouses. It's the people we live with that, that end up with all the, the hard sides of us. And she just said some really kind words and how proud she is of you and so I just want to acknowledge that. And can you just sort of wrap up by talking about the difference this has made at home, Craig? Yeah, it's, I, I'd say it's, it's, it has the potential to make generational differences because it's, um, it is, I don't, I don't want to get emotional. Like I probably will. Uh, I have um, three daughters that are married to three great young men, which is hard to believe. I like these guys because I love my daughter so much. And, but I like these guys and they all three, um, we're serving in the church and we're hired by the church. And just as a side note, they're not hired because they're my son-in-laws. <laughs> One of them didn't get uh, hired from multiple interviews. And I have a son that didn't get hired for a volunteer in- internship. So that tells you how strict it is. Meaning I just want to say you get on, you, you earn it and they've, they've earned it. Uh, and the way they're thinking now is honestly different because of the way I'm thinking. Your, your organization reflects how you think. Your family will reflect how you think. Your grandkids one day will re- reflect how you think. And um, I had so many unhealthy ways of thinking. And now to see um, one of my sons going through a more difficult time and coming in and watching him fight for God-honoring mindset and fight and talk his way into it, it's like I want to hug him, high five him, and then take him to the ground and just you know just just it's it's it's, it's mind blowing to um, see my daughter struggle in significant ways with massive complications and to see them continue to have faith in God and turn something that's a real trial into a story worth telling. It's I don't know that that would have happened in the same way if we hadn't started changing the tone at the top. And, uh, yeah. it's just, you know, whatever you're leading, if you're, if you're leading a, you know, uh, four volunteers in a two year old room, or you're the senior pastor or, or you're launching a tech business or whatever is, I just want to say your, your organization, your family, your marriage, it, it reflects the way you think. 
And if you don't like what you have, change the way you think. It's, it starts there. Um, and I, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I really admire you because when we get on, you've, we often talk just with obviously with no, nothing being recorded and, and you always say afterwards, I wish we recorded that. And I'm, like, oh, <laughs> I'm glad we didn't because I'm we're glad just, we didn't either. So talk so openly, but you're always fighting to see the good. You're always fighting to add value. You're always fighting to find something that, um, makes a difference in somebody's life. And that's one of the things that makes you great. You probably like the rest of us have a significant, most of us do one or two, um, unhealthy mindsets that would be holding you back. It, all of us do. And it's like, it's like a pro athlete. Okay. Well, if you're playing T-ball and you know, you got 15 kids, there's one coach when you're in the pros, you got a coach for every position, right? You get more coaching. The better you get, the more coaching you want, the more you want to work on this. There will, there, there will never be a day where I'm not working on my mindset. The more, the more tuned in it gets, the more I'm aware of where it's lacking. And so I've made tons and tons and tons and tons of progress, but I've still got, I've got some, some areas that there, there, it's on my, it's on my list today. God is renewing my mind with truth today in this area, this area, this area, this area. And, um, it's just, it's in, in the same way I try to, I want my body to be in the best shape I can to do what I do to serve Jesus. Um, long before that now, I want my mind to be in the best shape it can be to serve Jesus. And uh, it really, really matters. The science is there, scripture is there. And um, so I would just encourage, you know, our listeners to find one area. You can't fix it all. Find one area, whatever it is, and then um, find a, you know, a declaration or a truth and say it again and again and again and again and again. And when you don't believe it, keep saying it, keep saying it, keep saying it until you do believe it. And um, then wake up one day and you go, wow, I really am different. I do, I do believe something different. I believe something better today. And, um, and then, then you'll wake up and say, oh, my marriage has actually got a little bit better or my, <laughs> or my church is, is healthier uh, because, because it, 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 mindset matters more than you can imagine in your leadership and in every area of your life. Craig, it's so helpful. And uh, that was emotional in a good way. And I think it's when the people who are closest to you see the difference that you realize that all that discipline, all those mental pushups, all the, the things that you did are making a difference. For those of you who are watching the book, I've got it here. It's called Winning the War in Your Mind, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. Uh, it's available anywhere books are sold. And uh, if you don't subscribe to Craig's leadership podcast, you need to. It's called the Craig Groeschel Leadership Podcast. And uh, all the good stuff that you are doing. Um, and I love your preaching too. I got, I got to say, Craig, for being at it for 25 years, so much mad respect. I just feel like you're getting more vulnerable, more open, more passionate every year in, in a very, uh, very wonderful and inspiring way. So thank you for being with us today again. Well, that's a giant compliment. And again, I just can't compliment you, um, you enough. You're, you're, uh, great inspiration and your content helps us lead better. And then um, you're, you're also a great friend. And appreciate you so much, Carrie. Likewise. Thank you so much, Craig. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before. <laughs>